It's true, League of Legends is 90% of the time just jungle diff to decide who wins the game. We're not about to sit here and tell you otherwise. Well, for everyone except junglers. 90% of games for them are decided by which laners int the most kills into the enemy jungle. There's a bit of truth to both sides of the argument, but in this guide, we're going to take the jungler side just this once. Laners really do hand over a ton of free kills to the enemy jungle, and it's mostly because they don't understand basic jungle pathing. In this guide, we'll be covering some basic jungle tracking so you never die to obvious ganks again. Your junglers will thank you for it. And although this guide will be ADC focused, any role can take away big lessons here if you're interested. Before we get into that though, you've probably wondered to yourself, is skill capped really worth it? Well, let's find out. So what rank were you before you started skill capped? So I was bronze, but I think I was working my way back down to iron. May have been high silver, but I think I was gold. And what's the highest rank that you've achieved so far while using skill capped? I've got several accounts I've hit gold on. I'm in two. Is there anything skill capped helped you learn that would have taken you longer otherwise? If I keep track of where that enemy jungler is, uh, he's on the other side of the map and he's it looks like he's ganking by bot lane and I'm on the top side of the map. Uh, I can't get there in time, so there's no way I can impact that. I'm going to go seal his topside camps, or I'm going to grab Rift now. Just lots of ideas like, hey, I'm strong early, I'm Lee Sin. Let's, like, analyze all the lane matchups and go to a lane where I have Pryo and Invade. Like, that's not something I would be doing on my own every game, but that is something I'm doing because of skill cap. When I played League before skill caps, I was sort of playing and then feeding my way around. Um, and then after coming across skill caps and trying it for a little while, during one of the videos, I think, a sudden click of, hold on a second, this is not... This is not just a game of running around and, and killing people. This is a game about strategy. This is a game about moving the pieces so that the future becomes predictable and then acting on that future. So what are you waiting for? Get real results at skillcap.com. Link in the description below. Now back to the video. We'll be reviewing a couple of platinum and diamond games to show you that this is one of the simplest skills that everyone seems to lack for some reason. Our first replay features a platinum Aphelios with a Lulu versus Jin and Alistair. To kick the game off, Aphelios leashes for his Rengar. At this point in the game, you should be fairly vigilant to get information as to where the enemy jungle started. Looking at top first, we can see that Riven entered the lane fairly late. This could indicate that she leashed, but we can't be too certain. At the same time, Jin and Alistair appear in bottom, and Jin seems to only have three shots left in his gun, though he could have easily just autoed the blue once to fake a leash. It's still uncertain where Nocturne started, so Aphelio shouldn't make any assumptions just yet. Skipping ahead in the lane, and we can see that he's applying a standard strategy one would do versus a weak level 1 melee support. He's built up a big wave, and he's playing very aggressively with his Lulu to punish this Alistair. As he does so, he actually gets confirmation of where the enemy jungler is though, while his own Rengar invades Nocturne's red and kills him. Not only that, but now Rengar proceeds to take the Krugs as well, and it's looking like one of those jungle diff kind of games. So there's a bit of information to unpack here, so let's break it all down. Based on the fact that Nocturne was killed at his red at this time, it's obvious to assume he started bot side. And the fact that he's shown on the map means that when you press tab, you can see how much CS he's acquired. If you aren't aware, jungle camps each give a total of 4 CS for every one you kill. Aphelios has a lot of time at the moment to process this information. It's not like every second in League is some super micro-intensive battle versus your opponents. He knows Nocturne has 16 CS, his Rengar's topside, and all of Nocturne's bot side camps are still down from his initial route. Based on what you know, here's three options Aphelios could go for based on the wave that's coming in now. Should he fast crash the wave and look to contest the scuttle that's spawning in the river? He could also keep pushing the wave and harassing the enemy Alistair's weak early laning. Or should he allow this wave to build up and push back into him? Due to the even minion rule, it's guaranteed to push his way if he doesn't hit it anymore. Which would you choose and why? Starting with our first option, this is a bit too ambitious to go for. You should have noticed that Rengar is still fairly far away. By contesting Scuttle, it's almost guaranteed to be a 3v2. If Aphelios and Lulu had a bigger advantage, this might be good, or if Rengar was closer to the fight as well. But as it stands, it's not a good choice. So between letting it come back into him and pushing, let's see what Aphelios chose to do. 
He opts into continuing to play aggressively and abusing the advantage of having a ranged support in lane. At first, it's going rather well, and they're destroying this lane quite handily. But unsurprisingly, Nocturne eventually comes out from the fog of war and shuts their ambitions down by taking a free Lulu kill. Let's actually take a look at the situation from the lens of a jungler so you can better understand why pushing was such a horrible decision. Put yourself in Rengar's shoes for a moment. You just killed Nocturne and taken the rest of his jungle. By counting his CS, you can also assume he killed all four of these camps as well, which means he has no more of his jungle left. You should also know that jungle camps begin respawning at around 4 minutes and 20 seconds in the game based on where you started. So in this case, Nocturne's Gromp would respawn at that timing. Which means that although Nocturne may get this bot scuttle, he'd have around 40 seconds where he has absolutely nothing to do because all his camps are down. His only choice then is a desperate gank to claw his way back into the game. As Rengar, knowing how easy the rest of this game will be, you then pan your camera over to bot lane. You're sadly forced to watch as your Felios and Lulu give Nocturne his only way back into the game. There's no way this Rengar isn't thinking, Wow, I had the game won in three minutes, but my teammates can't play passively for a single minute. Awesome! We get that when you play League of Legends, you want to be the one in control of games. You want to be the one making plays to get ahead and carry the game on your own. But thinking about things from the enemy jungler and even your own jungler's perspectives can help you see some of the ridiculous decisions you may be making. If Aphelios had just allowed the wave to come back into him, Nocturne would be stuck in the river for 40 seconds with nothing to do. Instead, by playing aggressively, Aphelios handed a free assist over to Nocturne, which helped him back into the game, along with giving a kill over to Jin for no reason. Nocturne may still be behind from being invaded, but he should definitely be in a more hopeless situation than he currently is. This is the reason why all laners think every game is jungle diff, whereas junglers think every game is laner diff. Not many players try to look at things through others' perspectives, which is why they throw either their own or their teammates' leads all the time. Alright, let's move on to our next replay, in which we'll be reviewing a Diamond Elo Draven with his Renata versus a Samira and Nautilus. Here's a bit of context you'll need for this one, so let's break that down first. This game begins with a classic solo queue invade that turns into a massive brawl. The only things you need to be aware of is that Draven had to burn his flash and that Graves came out fairly ahead of Diana from the exchange. Otherwise, bot lane seems to have come out neutral at the end of the day. Now the game actually begins. As you should do every game, you need to discern where the enemy jungler started. Taking a look at top lane, we can see Sejuani entered lane fairly low at 1 minute and 40 seconds or so. This may lead you to believe she leashed, but in game you could easily make the assumption that she didn't. It takes about 10 seconds to walk from red to top. That means that she can't have lost this much HP to the red buff and then walked to top. It's literally not possible, so she probably just went from that level 1 fight straight to lane. When people usually get to lane from a leash is around 1 minute and 50 seconds or so, which is exactly when the enemy bot lane arrives, so we can assume the Diana started bot side. Anyway, this means that Draven can play very aggressively early on, and abuse his support's range advantage to dominate the lane just like the previous example. As he does so though, the enemy Yasuo randomly roams down there. The roam turns out to be incredibly non-threatening because it's a level 3 Yasuo, but nonetheless, Draven loses pressure in the lane. The result we want you to focus on is that now Samira and Nautilus are the ones in control over the wave. As we cover all the time, the way you win lane with ranged supports is by having a minion lead, so that the enemy engaged support can't all in. Without that advantage, Draven is forced to play much more reserved than before. This continues until a while later where Samira and Nautilus randomly start playing passively for no reason. They can clearly see all of Draven's teammates on the map, so their sudden gameplay shift is a bit odd. But this review isn't about them, it's about the decision Draven can now make. Because they're standing so far back, Draven can do anything he wants with the wave at the moment. Take a look at the game time and think about everything you know. First and most importantly, think about a very good assumption you could make about the enemy Diana at the moment based on the game timer. Your two big hints are to remember that she started blue buff and that she hasn't shown on the map at all yet. Based on your assumption, which of these choices do you think you'd go for? A. Continue freezing the wave around here to keep yourself safe. B. You'll take the opportunity your opponents have given you to push the wave and play towards your win condition with a ranged support. C. Or you'll wait until Graves makes his way down here and only then look to push the wave aggressively while he shadows you in this area. If you chose either A or C, then well done, but let's see if you got the reason why correctly. 
We briefly covered this in the previous replay, but when a jungler starts on one side of the map, their initial camps that they cleared begin respawning at around 4 minutes and 20 seconds. Based on the game timer and the fact that Diana hasn't shown on the map yet, it is very predictable that she full cleared her jungle, and is likely based to path back down here and do another cycle of her jungle as it respawns. That's exactly what was happening in game if we switch things over to her point of view. Right as she gets here, her gromp is respawning right on schedule. But first, she went to get the scuttle that was left over. And you can see her about to go straight back into her jungle before she looks over and realizes, wait a minute, this Draven is pushing versus a Nautilus. I should go down there for a free kill. Actually, no, no, I'll gank for once. This is the most important skill to understand about jungle tracking. You never want to die to ganks on a jungler's natural route, otherwise it puts them really far ahead. If you chose to push at this timing, then you really need to keep this in mind. Something we hear all the time is that predicting a low elo jungler is impossible. There's no point in trying because how am I supposed to know what they're doing if they themselves don't even know what they're doing? Sure, that's true, it's hard to avoid the ganks that make absolutely no sense, but dying to the ganks that you can predict is a whole different story. For example, there's a difference between a jungle are going to base and pathing top lane even though their Krugs and Raptors are down. It's unpredictable and doesn't make sense. Even if they do get the kill, they won't get that far ahead because they have no extra camps to farm in the area. Dying to these type of ganks is not really avoidable in solo queue, but when you die to junglers pathing well and effectively, then you're really accelerating how fed they get. Right after the kill, they can just go straight back into their own jungle to keep farming. The downside to this is technically that the enemy jungler is very predictable, but no one in solo queue bothers to learn jungle pathing, so that's why junglers get so fed all the time. Just take a look at this Diana's farm and KDA this game. She's participated in so many kills, yet retains really solid farm, all because the kills she was picking up coincided with the jungle route she was following all game. We know that learning jungle timings as an ADC may seem like a waste of time, but understanding how other roles function will make you much better at your own role in the long run. One of the best things you can do is just watch a few basic pathing guides and play jungle for yourself a couple games to understand the role much better. Once you do, you'll learn just how easy it is to track junglers, and you'll die to significantly less ganks, which as a result will let you carry way more games. Alright guys, before we wrap this up, let's tell you a little more about skill cap. So, we offer a 5 division rank up guarantee, and think that's a pretty crazy thing to offer. It's like a gym membership guaranteeing you'll get ripped. Your local gym would go bust if they offered that, right? Not us. We've offered this for years because our service really does work. It works so well, in fact, that we're able to produce by far the largest catalog of premium league guides on the internet. We add over 20 videos a week. With over 1,600 guides curated into over 100 courses, no one can compare. We've also sent challenger players into ELO Hell 714 times and counting, where they commentate how to carry live. They also respond to all questions asked. Sign up today for as little as $6.99 a month if you are serious about improving. Anyway, that's going to wrap this guide up. Thanks for watching, guys, and see you next time.